Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce um, a colleague and a longtime friend, uh, Professor Kate Fitzgerald, who is Professor and Vice Chair of Medicine, uh, Chief of the Division of Innate Immunity and the Worcester Foundation in Biomedical Science Research Chair at the University of Mass uh, Chan Medical School. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald's work focuses on the innate immune system and uh, understanding the molecular basis of the inflammatory response during infection and during autoimmune diseases. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald, as you will hear from her accent, conducted all her uh, academic training um, in Ireland, uh, her BSc, her PhD, and her postdoctoral work. Um, and then she joined UMass Chan um, and is currently a tenured professor there. She's an elected uh, fellow of the American Society of Microbiology, an elected member of the Royal Irish Academy and the National Academy of Science USA and the National Academy of Medicine USA. She's a recipient of several awards internationally recognized for her scientific expertise. And I'm not going to cut into your time any longer, Kate, but um, welcome and thank you very much for agreeing to be a keynote uh, for our talk. Over to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Elner. That was a kind introduction and um, congratulations to all involved in organizing this really wonderful uh, meeting. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. And we all can. Right. Hear I'll stick it into. OK, let me just get a. Perfect. OK, great. OK, so um, I'm going to talk about one of the areas of interest in my lab. So we, as Elner had mentioned, were broadly interested in mechanisms of inflammation, both in the context of infection, but also um, as we've learned that, that these same pathways that protect us from infection actually contribute to sterile inflammatory diseases and autoimmune diseases. So I'm going to talk about nucleic acid sensing and immune defense and really focus more on the offense where these pathways can become very offensive. So the innate immune system really functions to detect infection through recognition of um, microbial products, so pathogen-associated molecular patterns or activities of pathogens, for example, that might result in damage to host tissues and the release of danger signals. So the innate immune system can sort of detect these um, responses and then mount early innate responses, primarily through professional antigen presenting cells like dendritic cells, macrophages, et cetera. But it's also worth mentioning, and this will be relevant later in the talk, that you know all cells in many ways are innate immune host defense cells. Some are just more professional than others. So myeloid cells, for example. But the innate immune system then ultimately leads to activation of adaptive immunity, um, lymphocyte-driven immunity, and these collectively sort of drive an acute inflammatory response that, you know, in an ideal world will curb the growth and spread of a pathogen and limit damage to tissues. But if there's <clears throat> persistent, oh, persistent infection, for example, mm -hmm. someone needs to mute. Discussion. If there is persistent infection or um, some sort of genetic disorder that might lead to um, danger signals being released, for example, from tissues, you can have the innate immune system also contribute and, and drive kind of a chronic uh, inflammatory response that um, fails to self-limit and this can lead to pathology and damage to tissues. And of course, we know that this underlies many different types of diseases, ranging from neurodegeneration to cancer to arthritis, et cetera. So we're really interested in these pattern recognition receptors, and they survey cells sort of inside and out for signs of infection. So many of them are decorating the plasma membrane where they're involved in the detection of extracellular pathogens. I'm gonna focus on our area of interest, which has really become more on cytosolic recognition. And there's a number of different types of cytosolic sensors, but really in the case of today's lecture, I'm gonna focus on cytosolic DNA sensing pathways. And then within the endosome, there's also sensors particularly dedicated to sensing microbial nucleic acids. <clears throat> 
So within the cytosol, the pathway I'm going to talk about today is a pathway called the CGAS sting pathway. So during infection, CGAS is a DNA binding protein that recognizes double-stranded DNA, for example, from a virus. And then this is an enzyme. It actually converts ATP and GTP in the cell into this novel second, second messenger called cyclic GMP AMP. And then this second messenger binds to a protein on the ER called sting and sting becomes activated. It actually has very complex regulation, but once activated, it undergoes oligomerization. It translocates to the Golgi and there it recruits uh, a kinase called TBK1. And then TBK1 actually phosphorylates sting on its C-terminus. And these sort of series events then lead to activation of gene expression. IRF3 is a particularly important transcription factor downstream of this response, and then also NF-kappa B. So the sort of combined action of this pathway can lead to protective uh, antimicrobial defenses. And, and that's illustrated here on the right. This is just an example of uh, a mouse infected with a, a DNA virus, herpes simplex virus. This is an infection that's uh, in, into the eye of the animals. And, and normally, normal black six mice can control this infection quite readily. Um, and that's shown here in the black lines. They have a little bit of weight loss, but they, they largely um, control the infection. But if those animals lack CGAS, this DNA binding protein, then they really are unable to resolve that infection. They lose a lot of weight and they actually develop herpes simplex encephalitis. So in susceptible animals, the virus replicates and then it ultimately enters the brain stem and the brain. Um, and this leads to a lethal encephalitis in these animals. So this really just highlights how this kind of a pathway can be important in host defense. Um, and that's shown here, looking at the levels of um, viral loads in the trigeminal ganglion or in the brain. So if mice lack sea gas, Really, the virus replicates essentially out of control. So that's the sort of immune defense part of the talk. But I want to really focus on sort of our current understanding of how um, these same pathways distinguish self from non-self um, DNA, and and you know how do we avoid these pathways being activated by DNA, which is obviously, you know, inside our own cells and is an essential part of uh, all cells and organisms. So there's a number of different mechanisms that facilitate, facilitate this. One is that DNA is typically sequestered in the nucleus or the mitochondria of cells, but there's also um, some DNA enzymes outside cells. Uh, within the phagolysosomal compartment or even inside cells. And the function of these enzymes is to really limit the accumulation of self DNA within cells and prevent then activation of these pathways. Um, and you can imagine failure to sort of clear out DNA like this could lead to activation of a pathway like this. And in fact, that's exactly what's seen in, in some rare human diseases. So there are individuals with mutations actually in any of these DNAs, and those individuals develop a, sort of an autoimmune-like disease. Um, one example of that is DNAs2. So this is an enzyme that's in the phagolysosomal compartment. And there are patients that have hypomorphic mutations in DNAs2, and those patients develop a multi-system inflammatory syndrome, really sort of, you know, broad damage to tissues in the body. And, and studies in mouse models have shown that if you knock out the sea gas sting type one interferon pathway, you can really protect animals that lack this enzyme from this sort of a multi-system inflammatory disease. And then another example of that is TREX1. This is a, an enzyme that's located within cells. And TREX1 deficiency also leads to the accrual of double-stranded DNA in cells that activates the CGAS sting pathway. Um, and again, in this case, this leads to a CNS inflammatory disease. So we've been interested in sort of these diseases. And over the course of the last 10 years or so, there's been a growing number of these types of diseases have been described, all kind of different ways of modulating this pathway. So there are 
these diseases I just mentioned, so TREX1 loss of function, where the enzyme that would degrade the DNA is uh, ineffective because of mutation, that leads to a CGAS sting-driven neuronal disease. But there are also uh, mutations in the sting protein itself, and this is really what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk, that were described several years ago in uh, children. And these mutations lead to a disease called SAVI. It's sting-associated vasculopathy with onset in infancy. And these patients have heterozygous autosomal dominant mutations in sting. And again, they develop sort of a multi-organ inflammatory disease. And the idea is that sting is activated in these patients as a result of mutations. You don't need DNA upstream to activate, but then all the downstream consequences of sting activity are sort of seen in cells in these patients. So they have constitutive activation of TBK1, IRF3, et cetera. And, and this is what contributes to inflammation. And then I'll just mention, there's a number of more recently characterized diseases that sort of have manifest very similarly. One of them is described here called COPA syndrome. This is a mutation in a pathway that's involved in actually taking activated sting and bringing it back to the ER to turn off this response. And patients that have mutations in this COP1 uh, protein basically don't recycle sting back to the ER and they end up like savvy patients with um, constitutive activation of sting. And in humans, these diseases are characterized by very high levels of type one interferon in the circulation. So these patients have really high levels of interferon compared to healthy controls. So here's the savvy mutations, the TREX mutations or the DNAs2 mutations. So we've been particularly interested in, in SAVI uh, for a number of reasons, and I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of our published work and then finish with some of the ongoing unpublished work. So as I mentioned, these um, kids that have this disease have a series of mutations in the sting protein that leads to constitutive activation of sting. So in cells from these patients, sting is active all the time, it's translocating from the ER to the Golgi and interacting with these kinases to drive IRF3, NF-kappa B, type 1 interferons, inflammatory cytokines, and this is really what contributes to damage in the tissues of these um, individuals. And the patients actually primarily present with lung disease and interstitial lung disease. Um, and that's shown here in a chest CT scan. So you can sort of see these ground glass opacities in the uh, CT scans of these kids. And, and ultimately this is really what leads to mortality in these patients. And by H&E staining of these sort of aggregates, um, these are immune aggregates that consist of CD20 positive B cells and then CD3 positive T cells. So sort of uh, lymphocyte aggregates. And one of the reasons we think sting, uh, this disease primarily affects the lung is because if you look across the whole body, sting is most highly expressed in the lung. It's expressed abundantly sort of throughout the body, but it's really high in the lung in particular. So perhaps that might help explain this um, disease phenotype. So just to to begin to sort of study this disease, we generated mice that have the most common savvy mutation, this V154M. I'll refer to these as VM mice for the remainder of the talk. And if we do H and E sections of the lungs of these animals, you can see that like humans with this disease, the mouse develops um, these sort of immune aggregates shown here just by H and E staining of the lung sections. And you'll notice that these are sort of around vasculature and airways, so perivascular and peribronchiolar um, immune aggregates. And these are what's called bronchus-associated lymphoid tissue or BALT, uh, and that's shown here by uh, immunostaining of lung sections. So DAPI here stains just all cell nuclei. You can see these sort of aggregates of immune cells surrounding this live one positive um, blood vessel. Um, throughout these sections of the lung. And then if you look more closely, like what's seen in human disease, these are comprised of um, B cell and T cell sort of rich regions uh, in the lungs of these animals. And like the humans that have this disease um, in 
the periphery, this disease is characterized by uh, lymphopenia. So the patients, as well as mice, um, lose T cells and B cells in the periphery, so in the spleen, for example. But there's clearly a lot of these cells in the lungs of these animals. So the first question we wanted to address is, is type 1 interferon an important driver of disease? So that's kind of the initial hypothesis. Most of what we know about sting signaling has focused on the IRF3 type 1 interferon response. And we know from uh, patients that they have an elevation of an interferon response. So this is shown here with a, a gene signature and ISG signature. So high levels of ISGs in uh, cells of these patients. And like patients, the mice also have an elevated ISG response um, shown here. Oh, sorry, this is wild type. So wild type mice elevated ISG response in bone marrow drive macrophages from these animals. And if we knock out the interferon receptor, we can reduce that ISG response as you would expect. However, that had absolutely no impact on the lung disease, this interstitial lung disease in these animals. You can see that the VM mice um, succumb to the disease. And if those mice lack IFNAR or IRF3, not shown here, they, they die just as much as their wild type counterparts, and they still have BALT in the lung. So we're sort of tracking BALT now as a, a surrogate of sort of disease or ILD in these animals. So we were left then with a number of different questions, and, and can we take advantage of this mouse model to sort of begin to get at underlying mechanisms of this disease, and ultimately could this shed light on perhaps some therapies for, for these children who really have no treatment options and, and typically will die. So what are the factors that contribute to lung disease and then how is lung disease initiated? So because of this T cell rich zone uh, in these uh, immune aggregates in the lung, we thought, you know, this must be sort of sting activation perhaps in T cells that's contributing to this response. But we cross the savvy mice, these VM mice to TCR beta deficient mice um, and we really, we got some, we got rescue. Um, so, so that suggested that alpha beta T cells are important for mortality. And then we looked at T cells in the lungs of these um, TCR beta deficient, uh, or, or we looked at uh, sort of mortality and cellular activation in these animals. And we did that by um, taking advantage of a technique where right before you sacrifice the mice, you can inject uh, a CD45 labeled antibody IV for about three minutes. And then when you take down these animals, you can then distinguish immune cells based on CD45 expression that are intravascular, so sort of circulating in the blood versus cells that are already out of the blood. Um, so this will label the cells that are still in the vasculature, but have not yet extravasated into the tissue. And then you can kind of look at immune cells in the blood or in the tissue um, based on CD45 staining. So we know in um, the VM animals that there's accumulation of interferon gamma producing uh, T cells in the lungs. So based on CD69 interferon gamma staining, that's just quantified there. Um, so we then went on to look at the role of interferon gamma in this disease. And again, like the TCR beta deficiency, if you look at survival here, so red is always the savvy mice. Um, TCR beta deficiency, as I just showed you, um, really sort of protects these mice from mortality. And similarly, the interferon gamma receptor knockouts are also protected, not completely, but, but largely protected. And then again, if you look at... Um, the T cells in the lungs of the VM mice, the um, activation of those cells is uh, reduced in inferring gamma receptor deficient mice. And, and similarly, B cells also accumulate in the lung. And this is also dependent on both T cells and uh, inferring gamma receptor. Um, and myeloid cells, particularly neutrophils, also accumulate in the lungs of these animals. But interestingly, this is dependent on um, T cells, but it's independent of interferon gamma receptors. So there must be other aspects of T cells 
that are driving uh, myeloid cell recruitment and inflammation into the lungs of these mice. So we then wondered, you know, since um, lymphocytes are important and interferon gamma is important in driving disease, is it, you know, sting in the immune compartment? You know, is it immune cells that have this sting gain of function mutation that are driving disease? And to do that, we use radiation chimera experiments. So here we're transferring either wild type bone marrow or savvy bone marrow into wild type or savvy lethally irradiated recipient mice. And you can see wild type into wild type mice. You know, these are just uh, healthy lungs. They don't have any evidence of BALT. If you take now the bone marrow from a VM mouse and put it into a wild type host, you can also see, we were a little surprised to see this result that there's no um, BALT formation in the lungs of these animals. But now if you take wild type bone marrow and you transfer that into a VM host, you see really aggressive, in fact, it's even worse than what we see in the, in the VM mice. So, so this suggested that um, radio resistant cell expression of the savvy mutation is required for disease and not um, sting expression in immune cells. Although immune cells are required to um, lead to mortality in these animals. So this is just looking, um, just some of the controls here. This is looking at the percentage of the lung area that has immune aggregates. So the wild type into VM chimeras have immune aggregates. These animals succumb um, to disease, unlike the other chimeras. And then all of the immune cells in the lungs of these wild type into VM animals are actually 100% donor derived. So these are wild type T cells in the lungs of these VM uh, hosts. So the only the only T cells here are normal wild type T cells, um, and those T cells are activated. So what I've shown you so far is in this disease where there's constitutive activation of sting, we think based on these chimeras that a radio resistant cell in the lung is important as an instigator of disease, sort of helping to recruit immune cells, particularly um, T cells into the lung. And then these T cells become activated in the lung and they can um, produce interferon gamma and this further sort of amplifies inflammation and leads to these the formation of these BALT structures. And, and ultimately these animals will succumb to this um, ILD phenotype. So our next question was, you know, given that lymphocytes are important in the disease, but the sting mutation does not need to be expressed in lymphocytes, you know, how is lung disease initiated? And we really wanted to, to get at that using, a, a, you know, a new approach. So to do that, we generated a new mouse model where we could conditionally turn on expression of this savvy mutation uh, in a creed dependent manner. And, and we generated a mouse, this was in collaboration with Sebastian Gringas and Mark Schlamczyk at the University of Pittsburgh, where upstream of the um, savvy allele, uh, we introduced an adenoviral splice acceptor site that's under the control of LOX-P um, sites here. So normally um, in, in these animals, there's a frame shift that results in nonsense mutations and you don't get any expression of sting in this context. Um, but if you take uh, a CRE, a mouse that expresses CRE recombinase, in this case under the control of a constitutive promoter, you now will lead to um, excision of this anaviral splice acceptor site and you'll basically turn on expression of the savvy allele. So this is controlling under sort of native um, expression you know, so we're not overexpressing. It's really sort of a, a nice system to allow normal expression of this sting mutation wherever sting would be normally expressed. And, and that just, this just shows that this works. This is just staining for sting um, in uh, the conditional knock-in. Um, and you can see that you get nice expression um, of this savvy allele when you turn on, um, when you turn on Cree. And this is, in this particular mouse, oh, the only sting expressed here is savvy because it's crossed to a, a knockout allele on the other um, allele. 
So the first question was, does this mouse develop the same sort of lung disease? And, and it does. So we crossed um, this conditional knock-in to a CMV Cree. So this will turn on sting everywhere, anywhere that sting is expressed. And we basically feed and copy what we saw with the original mouse. So we see these bald structures surrounding endothelial in the lung, and there's increased recruitment of uh, extravascular immune cells. These animals lose weight and they develop splenomegaly. So they basically have all the features that we saw in the original mouse. So now that we know that we can use this mouse um, to turn on sting, this savvy allele in a tissue or cell type specific manner and ask if we turn this on in a T cell versus you know, a non-immune cell, can we develop or can, can this mouse lead to the development of interstitial lung disease? But before we did that, we need to really understand which cells express sting uh, in the lung. So if we look by uh, immunohistochemistry using a sting antibody, here we're looking at lung sections. So just to orient you, this is a sting knockout here, and you can see that there's no green. Here are uh, the savvy mice and then normal uh, wild type mice. And we're staining here with uh, DAPI, which will stain all cells, live one for endothelia. And then uh, this is a podoplanin stain as well. So cells that are live one positive. So in red here are the blood vessels. And you can see that these very nicely express um, sting. And then live one podoplanin double positive cells are lymphatic vessels. Um, and then the podoplanin only expressing cells are um, alveolar epithelial cells. So you can see in, in blue here, there's obviously a lot of alveolar epithelial cells in the lung. These are the um, vascular endothelials. These are the conducting airways. And then these sort of purple colors that are blue and red together are the lymphatic endothelial cells. And you can see that um, sting is broadly expressed. So it's expressed in epithelial cells, endothelial cells, and other fibroblasts as well in the lung. So since sting is widely expressed in the lung, which of these cell types might be important in sort of driving this savvy disease? Because we know it's a non-hematopoietic cell. We also just sort of validated that expression of sting using flow cytometry. So this really just shows that sting is very highly expressed in um, CD31 positive endothelial cells, also in epithelial cells, and then also in immune cells. So myeloid cells, T cells, B cells, really quite broadly expressed and very highly expressed in these cells in the lung. So we then took advantage of the, this new mouse and we crossed it to a Cree that will only express the savvy allele in epithelial cells. And we did not see any evidence of uh, BALT formation. If we cross it to a PGGF receptor alpha Cree, which would only express sting in fibroblasts, again, the lungs look healthy and normal. But now if we cross it, the sting allele to type two Cree, um, and TIE2 allowed us to turn on sting in endothelial, but also hematopoietic cells. So this is a caveat of this system. So sting, um, this mouse developed interstitial lung disease, developed ILD, and similar to what I've shown you earlier, developed these bolt-like structures. And as we look at immune cell recruitment into the lung, this um, conditional allele, so turning sting on um, through TIE2, led to immune cell recruitment into the lung. But we really wanted to have a better system to distinguish endothelial cells from hematopoietic cells. And if you recall from the chimera experiments, we don't think sting is important in hematopoietic cells. Um, and this was a promising result because it suggested that sting in endothelium was important, but we really wanted a cleaner system to get at this question. So to do that, we... Um, used a couple of different alternative Cree strains. Um, this is looking at the expression of uh, YFP. So we crossed a reporter into these mice as well. So we could sort of see which cells were actually going to be turned, have sting expressed. So, so in the endothelium using Tai 2 Cree, as I just showed you, you get nice expression in endothelium, but also in lung immune cells. And TIE2 targets uh, prenatally, so you end up with um, pre-expression in immune cells and endothelium. But we 
instead then used uh, Katerin 5 Cre. This is under an inducible, tamoxifen inducible um, promoter, ERT2 CD8 5 Cre. And this would allow us to only target endothelial cells. Um, and we do that with a constitutive tamoxifen inducible system and also the, oh, sorry, the um, CDH5 Cre. And you can see now you're only seeing YFP expression in the endothelium and not in immune cells. But the, the CAG ERT2, uh, which is also you know, postnatal, but it's inducible everywhere, also develop um, or also has expression in both immune and non-immune cells. So using this approach, then we tracked uh, lung disease. And you can see after tamoxifen treatment in the Caterin 5 pre, this was sufficient. So only turning on sting in the endothelium was sufficient to lead to these immune aggregates in the lung. This is the um, constitutive. So again, in both of these, you see evidence of ILD and you see these bald structures and immune cells recruited to the lung. So, so just turning on sting in the endothelium is sufficient to bring those lymphocytes into the lung. But we do still think that perhaps there might be other cells that are contributing to lung disease because you'll notice the sort of the nature of these aggregates are a little bit different. So on, when you only turn it on in the endothelium, it's a bit more dispersed. They're not quite as tightly packed, perhaps suggesting that there might be other cell types that help you know, consolidate these bald structures or, or lead to further activation of immune cells. And, and we have some evidence that other cells might be important because if we track immune cell activation in the lungs of the Caterin 5 versus the CAG CRE. Lymphocytes are activated um, in the CAG CRE, but, but not in the Caterin 5. So, so the endothelial expression of sting will bring these cells to the lung, but some other um, signals are needed to lead to their full activation. Um, and the endothelium is also further activated, you know, in the, the CAG CRE versus the um, Caterin 5 CRE. So one of the sort of hypotheses that we have is that the endothelium um, could contribute to the recruitment of lymphocytes into the lung through upregulation, for example, of adhesion molecules. And, and here we're just staining sections for VCAM1. This is one adhesion molecule that could be important in recruitment of lymphocytes into the lung. And you can see nice staining for VCAM in the endothelial specific mice. So turning on sting in the endothelium leads to elevated uh, VCAM expression. But when you have sting expressed in a lot of different cell types, you see much greater um, VCAM expression, suggesting that it's turned on in the endothelium, but also in other um, cell types in those animals. So a key question is, what, what is it about sting signaling in the endothelium that might lead to the recruitment of lymphocytes into the lung to drive this disease? And, and we've begun some bulk RNA-seq and also single cell RNA sequencing experiments to begin to look at sting signaling in and sting-induced gene expression in, in these tissues. And, and when we sequence the endothelia from these savvy mice, we see, you know, elevated inflammatory genes, um, chemotactic genes, genes involved in antigen presentation, you know, not surprisingly, sort of a lot of chemotactic factors. And we're really now focused on trying to understand these mechanisms um, to better understand how the endothelium could be contributing to disease pathogenesis. So just to summarize, um, what I've shown you so far by, by taking advantage of this uh, mouse model where we basically introduce a mutation that's seen in humans with savvy, we can recapitulate many of the features of human disease. So sting is widely expressed in immune cells, in non-immune cells, including endothelia, epithelia, fibroblasts in the lung. We think based on both the bone marrow chimera data and then this um, ability to turn sting on in different cell types in a cell type specific manner, we think endothelia, but perhaps other cells um, collaborate here with the endothelium, but we think sting expression in the endothelium is leading to upregulation of adhesion molecules, probably chemokines, 
that can recruit T cells in particular and B cells into the lung um, and then contribute to their activation, although we think some other signals are also needed for the activation of the um, lymphocytes in, in this context. Um, the recruited T cells can then produce interferon gamma, which we know is important and activate um, both uh, B cells and, and recruit and maintain uh, neutrophils in the lung. And I didn't have time to show you this, but we also see that there's evidence of autoimmunity here in these animals. And, and we think there's a self antigen in the lung that's contributing to um, the activation of these lymphocytes. So, so collectively, this sort of sequence events leads to lung inflammation and ultimately the mortality of these animals. So what are the potential therapeutic implications of this? So so, you know, you're activating the sting pathway, so you would think you could inhibit sting activation that might sort of block these early instigating um, events. We don't think it's type 1 interferon here, so we think it's really an nf kappa b driven uh, endothelial cell activation mechanism. But because these early events then recruit and activate adaptive immunity in the lungs of these animals, you really probably need a combined approach where you also have some sort of strategy to limit either the recruitment or the activation of uh, lymphocytes in the lung and, and maybe a combined strategy of targeting sting in the endothelium, as well as you know, a JAK inhibitor or interferon gamma receptor inhibition might be sort of a two punch to, to impact this disease. And then in future directions and actually ongoing studies, we're really trying to dissect, you know, what is it about the sting pathway in these endothelial cells that are driving these responses? And of course, we're because it's endothelium, we're focused on um, the extravasation of lymphocytes, chemokines, atesia molecules, all sorts of measures of endothelial cell function. Um, and perhaps uh, the cooperation of sting in other non-immune cells like fibroblasts and epithelia might, might also contribute to these systems. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll finish. I just wanna acknowledge the people who did the work. So all of this work is really a collaboration with my lab and Anne Marsha Krotstein, my neighbor here at UMass. And then it was initially started by Mona Matwani, who was a joint graduate student with us. Mona graduated a couple of years ago. And really most of the work I showed you today is driven by an incredibly talented MD PhD student who just had his defense a couple of days ago. And now Christy Chang, another graduate student is, is working to sort of further study endothelial cell function. And then I mentioned Mark and Sebastian, and, and we really try and work um, closely with Rafaela Goldbach-Mansky at the NIH to, you know, to see the kind of insights we make with this mouse model, how it might relate to the human disease and um, Rafaela treats and, and initially describe these diseases. And I, I wanna particularly thank the Lupus Research Alliance who gave us some early funding for this project and um, also the NIH. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'm going to thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop sharing. OK, and uh, I have a number of questions here for you. I hope you can. Uh, yeah, uh, happy to. That's great. So the first question is, um, you know, in the context of these radio resistant cells in, in Savvy, what other cell types do you think are involved in this consolidation and activation of immune cells? Yeah, we so initially we really thought that epithelial cells might be the the initial driver because sting is really highly expressed in those cell types. Um, it doesn't seem to be epithelial cells. We have some evidence that fibroblasts, so FRCs, are have been shown to be important in sort of um, the structure of these bolts um, in the lung and other contexts. So so we're actively looking at the role of sting in um, fibroblastic reticular cells um, to see if that's somehow cooperating. So I think the endothelial cell brings in the lymphocytes, but there's some other signal that's then helping to sort of activate and propagate those mechanisms. So yeah, we don't, we don't know yet. It's a lot um, of mass breeding. So again, the question related, you, you said that uh, type one interference 
do not have a role in this, but when we think of endothelial cells, everyone, especially lung disease, you think of um, interferon lambda. So have you? Yeah, yeah we, we did. So we've gen we, uh, we also initially thought that interferon lambda would be important because there is, there is an ISG signature, but actually we think it's more interferon gamma than interferon lambda is important in driving that ISG signature in the lung. The interferon lambda receptor knockout mice, we had some evidence that they might have a little bit of protection in terms of the mortality, but but it's not, it hasn't really held up. So I think lambda is not important, or at least our, we don't have definitive evidence that it is important. Okay, so another question relates to your comment about lung self-antigens. So have you any thoughts on what those self-antigens might be? Yeah, we we are in the process of sort of doing mass spectrometry. So so we have evidence that you know if we restrict the T cell repertoire, the B cell repertoire, we can um, limit disease. You know, using OT2, OT, those sorts of approaches. We do see evidence of autoantibodies that stain lung sections. You know, we see clear bands on by immunoblotting, and we're in the process of basically identifying those by mass spec. So we don't know yet. Okay, so then that leads into the, the final question was, um, you focused on the lung on SAVI, but when we talk about self-antigens, these might have implications for autoimmunity beyond the lungs. So presumably you must be exploring that. Wonderful. Yeah, we so we these mice are interesting. The we had a paper about a couple of years ago shown they also develop um, colitis, so spontaneous colitis, and we've looked a lot at that in the in the gut, and that seems to be much more dependent on sting activation in myeloid cells. So it's different to the lung, where it's you know it's really non hematopoietic cells. We haven't really looked at auto antigens in other tissues. Yeah, we're just kind of that that's a newer aspect of this that we're looking at right now. Okay, we have a, a final question here from a colleague in Japan um, who's asked that who've commented that fibroblasts also express VCAM1 and they also act as lymphoid tissue organizers. So yep. in the PDGFRA CRE mice, could you see upregulation of VCAM1 or chemokine expression in fibroblasts? Yeah, that, that's a great question. We, we didn't do the VCAM staining, I don't think, on those mice. You know, we, we didn't see bulk structures in the PDGF receptor CRE. So that, that suggested that at least the fibroblasts were not kind of instigators of the early steps in this process, but but they still, we haven't directly looked at these fibroblastic reticular cells, which we're in, you know, we're, that's the sort of something we're really interested in doing now. They may, so it's true, fibroblast expressing, they'll upregulate many of these chemokines, um, atesia molecules too, so, th so they certainly could be contributing. Um, but we want to turn it on in these FRCs because those are the ones that are thought to help with the structures of the bolt and the lung. And then I'll, I'll just finish with a final question from um, an MD in Kenya who asks, um, what are the role of nets essentially in, in all of this in SAVI? Yeah, that's a good question. We see a lot of neutrophils recruited into the lungs of these mice. Um, we haven't directly stained for nets actually in this project. We do in other contexts. Yeah, I don't know. That's a that's a good question. I mean, they could they could certainly be contributing and amplifying inflammation in this setting. Okay, we've got lots yeah. of other questions coming in. So I'll do one last one. Yeah, and then I can try and answer some in the chat. Did you look into TGF beta in relation to fibroblasts and effects on T cells? Ah, uh, we have not. Okay, well, that was a short answer. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us this Saturday. Yeah, thank you for the invitation and uh, congrats on a wonderful meeting. All right, thank you very much.